Thank you for that. Go ahead and take your Bible. Open it up to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning reading at verse number 1. I've enjoyed Brother Melvin. Amen? Amen. His preaching was not just good, it was good. Amen? <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever forget that. That's all there is to it. I may try to forget it. I may want to forget it. But I don't know that I'll ever forget that. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning a reading at verse number 1. I want us to think this morning for just a few minutes about neglecting salvation. This is not about rejecting salvation. This is about neglecting the gift of salvation. Neglecting what God has done in me. Neglecting the fact that I'm born again. Neglecting the fact that I was lost and I'm saved. Neglecting the fact that I was bound by sin, but He made me free. Neglecting the fact that God did something for me that I could never do for myself. Neglecting the fact that I was lost, but now I'm saved. Are you there? Therefore, well, we can't preach chapter 1, but boy, if we could. The therefore is always there for a reason. It tells us what God has already done, and He leads into this with that. We must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Five times in these verses are the word, is the word we. Lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It sure is tempting here to preach about so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Let me ask you today, do you remember when God saved you? Well, don't get too excited. Do you remember when God saved you? You were very, very lost. And then God saved you, and you could say today, I am very, very saved. I was lost in my sin. I was living in rebellion against God. I was pursuing the world. I was sowing to the wind. I was reaping the whirlwind. I was going against God. I was living in rebellion. I was prideful and arrogant and disobedient to God. I was rejecting the Word. The Spirit may have been convicting me, but I was rejecting and denying His work in my life. I was lost, and I lived as if I was lost. I was living in absolute rebellion against God. And then He saved me. And then He forgave me. And then He set me free. Like a captive, my chains were gone. I was free. God did a work in me that I could never do for myself. God took away my sin. God forgave me. God placed His Holy Spirit inside of me. I was suddenly a child of God. I knew His presence. I knew His peace. My sins had been taken away. I was a new creature in Christ. All things had passed away and everything was being made new. Saved. Saved by His power divine. Saved. Man, I wish I could sing. Saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete. I'm saved, saved, saved. Are you saved? I remember early in my preaching where the Melvin was talking about my antics on stage, and I don't know why it happens. It just happens. It's who I am. 
but I remember when I was much younger and early in the ministry, I was very energetic when I preached. All over the stage, up and down the aisles in churches, I mean, preachers, there's an unusual freedom about 10 rows deep. Are y'all with me on that? When you get away from your notes and you get away from the pulpit and you're about 10 rows deep, you've got to rely on God back there. And man, I just remember being free, man, enjoying God. Man, I'm saved. I'm a preacher of the gospel. Man, I'm so happy. I'm serving God. And I remember an old cantankerous brother pulled me aside one night. Every preacher is not a blessing. And he was to me. And he pulled me aside. I was 20 years of age or so. He said, brother, all these antics. He said, I've been at it a number of years, and one of these days you'll get over all of that. He needed to be punched. Are y'all with me on that? <laughs> Don't tell that to a young preacher. Let him enjoy his salvation. Let him enjoy the energy God gives him to preach. Let him enjoy serving God, preaching God, knowing grace, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me enjoy that. It was obvious he had gotten over it. And some of us have gotten over the joy of being saved. We're neglecting our salvation. He didn't say what's going to happen if we reject so great a salvation. That would be lost people deliberately rejecting God. He said, what if we neglect? How shall we escape... How shall we escape the chastening hand of God? How shall we escape discipline? How shall we escape spiritual and godly punishment? How shall we escape, and I don't know how you were raised up, but I remember hearing people say, I got a whipping from God. You ever gotten a whipping from God? God whipped me. Man, God took me out to the, to the house out back. God took me to the woodshed. I got a whipping from God. And the writer, I believe, is saying, how am I going to avoid the woodshed if I neglect so great a salvation? If it's about rejecting salvation, that's another sermon. But this is about believers the very last verse of chapter number 1 talks about those who will inherit salvation. And then he goes into the talk about neglecting salvation. Those of us who have inherited it. Those of us who know the hand of God. Those of us who know what it's like to be saved. Those who know what it's like to be a child of God. How shall we escape the woodshed? How shall we escape chastening and the just reward if we neglect the great salvation that comes only through the Lord. And so here's the illustration. The people of God had been delivered out of captivity. These are three types of people. They've been delivered out of captivity. They are bound for the promised land. And this is not heaven. This is not heaven. This is the blessing and favor of God. This is walking in joy. This is walking in peace with God and with fellow man. This is knowing God. It's what Herb talked about last night, Brother Herb. It's what he talked about last night when he talked about knowing the power of God on your life. They're no longer in captivity. They are bound for the presence of God. Bound for the promises of God. Bound for the power of God. Man, they are bound for God. They're no longer in captivity. They've been released. It's a picture of people. There are some that are living in captivity still. They are lost. They're in bondage. They've never been made free. Thank God, though, there are those over here that know the hand of God. They know that they've been made free, and they are walking in all the promises and the power that God gives us. But there are some that are in the wilderness, wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. It was A.W. Tozier that said that a rut 
is nothing more than a grave with both ends knocked out of it. And there's a lot of us believers that are just in a rut. Man, you can get in a rut as a preacher. Man, you can get in a rut singing the same old songs every Sunday. You can get in a rut as a deacon. And you lose your joy. And you just become, doggone it, you just become bitter and cantankerous. And you're not really enjoying your salvation. You're not in the Word. I mean, preachers, you may be going and pulling up Sermon Central and copying and pasting a sermon for the next Sunday. You're not walking with God. God's not speaking to you. Are y'all with me? I'm getting tired of going around in circles. Is anybody else with me? Are you tired of going around in circles? I've been saved out of captivity. And I know that there's got to be something better. I wonder how many Christians spend their entire journey in the wilderness. Neglecting salvation. Oh, I'm saved. But I'm not just neglecting the fact that I've been gifted with salvation. I am neglecting the fact of the surrender of the Lord Jesus Christ on my behalf. I am neglecting the sacrifice for my sin. But more than any of that, I am neglecting my Savior. I'm neglecting Him. I'm neglecting knowing Him. I'm neglecting fellowshipping with Him. I'm neglecting walking with Him. I'm neglecting Him who saved me if I'm neglecting my salvation. Three kinds of people. Those who are in captivity, those who are in the presence and fellowship and sweetness of knowing God, and those who are wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. I think Brother Herb mentioned it the other night. I think you did. You talked about justification, sanctification, and glorification. And and there's a lot of folks that are going to miss sanctification. They want to go straight from being justified to being glorified. But there is a sanctifying process. And nobody ever said that being sanctified was pretty. It is an ugly process at times. It is a cleansing process. It is where God is working on me. It is where God is making me holy. It is where God is making me pure. It's where He's removing the dirt and the grime. It's where He's working on the places that nobody knows about. He's working on my mind and the thoughts that I have that I shouldn't be thinking. He's working on my mouth when I say words I shouldn't be saying. He's working on my body, my spirit, my mind, my soul. He's setting me apart for His glory. Some of us in that sanctifying stage get caught up in the wilderness if anybody ever told you that being a Christian was easy they lied to you Bonhoeffer I die daily if you've never read Dietrich Bonhoeffer you ought to read his story he knew something about being in the wilderness but he also knew something about making it into the presence of God. This is not heaven that I'm talking about over here. This is in the here and now. This is knowing God today. This is feasting on manna today. It's walking by by faith today. It's the cloud by day and the fire by night today. It is God's presence with me now. Not just in heaven If I'm neglecting my salvation, I am disregarding the fact that I was hopelessly lost and couldn't save myself. If I'm neglecting my salvation, it means I'm unconcerned. I've become unconcerned about His love and His plan for my life. If I'm neglecting salvation, 
I've become complacent about the cross. Now, brother, I preached in Jasper a few years ago, too. And I'll never forget what happened in this particular church in Jasper I was preaching in. It was an old, old, old church. I think Moses helped build it. It was old. And I remember at that time I traveled with a little sound system. I was always singing and preaching. I was the preaching singer and the singing preacher. And I took any gig I could get because I wanted to be busy in the work of the kingdom. I sang in nursing homes, brotherhood breakfast. I mean, I was everywhere anybody wanted to preach her. I was there and I had my karaoke machine. Can you see me now? <laughs> and I went into this old church. I had a couple of speakers, a PA, got it all hooked up. Man, I'm ready to sing. I'm ready to preach. I got it plugged in. Went over no power. Strong. The outlets are not working. What's up? The lights are on. What's wrong with the outlets? I was the only person there except for one old man in the back. He was probably a trustee, a deacon or something. I don't know what he was. He was all the way, all the way in the back of the church. He said, hey, hey, preacher, do you not have any power? I said, no, what's up? He said, he looked at the cross at the back of the church he said, if you'll go back there to that old cross, there's a switch down at the bottom of that cross there. If you'll turn on the cross, the power will come on. We need to turn on the cross. Spurgeon talked about making a beeline for the cross. A beeline for the cross, knowing that that is our victory. That is where Jesus died. And if I'm neglecting my salvation, I've become complacent about the cross. Amen. Why did he write this? There's the relevance in his writing. And the relevance is you're drifting. Jimmy Draper says, you never drift anywhere worth going. Do you know of anybody today that's drifting? They're saved. Child of God, been born again. They are baptized. They're a believer. They've known God, but today they are drifting. Do you know anybody like that? You never drift anywhere where you're where, you never drift anywhere worth going if you're drifting. And the idea is of a ship that is not anchored. It is a picture of a ship that is drifting aimlessly out in the harbor. You know about that down here. A boat that is not anchored, and it just drifts wherever the wind blows. It has no direction. Nobody knows where it's going. It's not anchored. And for us as believers, maybe the writer of Hebrews is saying, it's time for you as believers to get anchored. It's time for you to put down roots. It's time for you to grow in God. You're drifting aimlessly. You have no direction, and Draper's right. You don't drift anywhere worth going. I have a couple of three large friends. One of them we've vacationed with over the years. His name's Steve. He'll easily weigh 300 pounds. I remember several years ago, down at the Gulf, Orange Beach, he had bought a little old float at the Dollar General. He aired that thing up and laid down on it and was going to drift, was going to, going to rest and relax, if you will, on the water there in the Gulf. And he went to sleep. He drifted out so far you, you almost couldn't see him. When you, can't, when you almost can't see a 300-pound man, he's too far. <laughs> now let me tell you, it is dangerous for a 300-pound man to be drifting that far in the Gulf of Mexico on a Dollar General float. There's things beneath him he knows nothing about. There's predators that could take his life. There's depths. He don't know how deep it is. He's too far. He's much farther than he ever intended to be. Sin will take you farther. Then you want to go slowly but wholly taking control. Sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. 
and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. My, my friend had gone further than he ever imagined. Now, it is dangerous for a 300-pound man to be floating in the middle of the Gulf on a Dollar General float, but this drifting here is much more dangerous. It's a child of God that's drifting from God. He knows where he ought to be. He knows the life he ought to be living, but he's not living that life. He has neglected his salvation. He has drifted away from God. He's not where he ought to be. He's not where he needs to be. But not only is there relevance in this writing, because it is relevant in that we are drifting. It's relevant in that we are neglecting our prayer life. It's, it's relevant because we neglect Jesus. We neglect His Word. We neglect our walk with Him. We neglect knowing Him. We just neglect Him. And just as I believe, no one gets saved accidentally. You get saved on purpose. No one drifts into salvation. Well, I just drifted into my relationship with God. No one casually drifts into salvation. And one day they were lost and they casually drifted into a relationship with God. No, no one ever got saved by drifting into salvation. It was on purpose. Lord, save me. God, I'm lost. God, forgive me. It was a prayer prayed on purpose. And just as no one ever drifts into salvation, no one will ever drift into a daily walk with God. You do it on purpose. You don't drift into a prayer life. You pray on purpose. You don't drift into Bible study. You read it on purpose. You don't drift into church. You go on purpose. Drifting. But there's another word. It's the reason I believe for his writing. And the word there that leaps off the page to me is the word escape. How shall we escape what? How shall we escape the just reward that he speaks of? How shall we escape discipline and punishment and chastening? How shall we escape the woodshed? How shall, shall we escape the hand of discipline of Almighty God if I neglect the good work that He's done in me? How shall I escape? So I googled a few thoughts this morning on this to find out what anybody might have been saying that I could... Google and pull up their ideas. And John MacArthur simply began his little talk. And what I could find this morning by saying, We won't. And pretty much everyone you read in regard to this passage, the answer is, We won't escape. We won't escape chastening and discipline and the, the punishing hand of God. We won't escape the woodshed. My dad this morning is about to be 86 years old. He's in a nursing home up in Tuscumbia. He has dementia. We've been having some of the greatest conversations over the past two or three years because suddenly, the past couple of years, mother is still alive. Suddenly, all of his friends that passed away, they're still alive, and he had coffee with them yesterday morning. Some of the best years of his life. We're having good conversations. Everybody that's dead is still alive. He still lives in the old home place. He's still working. He's still painting houses. He's still answering calls. God's still real to him. His life is still real to him. He went to church last week. Man, he saw his mother and daddy in Hartzell last week. <laughs> These are good days for my dad. They're a little rough on me. They're good on him. Man, I love my daddy. I respect and admire my daddy. He meant what he said and he said what he meant. Did you ever have a daddy like that? We didn't have a woodshed, but we had a, I had a bedroom. And in these were his words, son, 
You go on back here to your bedroom. I'll be back here in a little while. And I'm thinking, <laughs> could we just go ahead and get this over with right now? Could you just go ahead and maybe throw me out in front of a Mack truck right now? I'd rather go ahead and get this over with because sometimes Daddy would say, you go back there to that bedroom, I'll be back there in a minute. Sometimes he was back there in a minute. Sometimes he waited an hour. But I knew he was coming. And I knew he meant what he said. And I knew he said what he meant. And even though my daddy was never mean or abusive to me in any way, and I never received, honestly, more than five or six good whoopings, I didn't need any more than that. I learned real quick. He means what he says. God's Word is serious. I remember one night, we were going down to visit some friends. It was a Saturday night. And I was about an eight, maybe nine-year-old boy. My sister, about five years older than I, my mom and dad, me and my sister in the back seat, we were going down to the house where some of my friends lived. They had a couple of boys about my age, and man, I enjoyed being with Quinn and Blake. But they had a new pond that had just been dug out behind their house. And on the way down to Quinn and Blake's, my daddy said to me, Son, he looked over, don't go down to the pond. Don't go down to that pond. And he looked over the seat and he said to me, do you understand? Do you, your dad ever do that to you? Do you understand? Don't go down to the pond. Man. You know what I'm thinking as an eight-year-old kid? What's going on at the pond? <laughs> Something's going on at the pond. Don't go, do you understand me? Don't go down to the pond. We got there, got out of the car, played outside a few minutes, mom and dad, everybody else inside. Quinn said, hey, you want to go down to the pond? I said, yeah, I've been waiting for you to ask. Let's go to the pond. Everybody's going to the pond. I want to go, you want to go. All God's children want to go. Let's go to the pond. Daddy said, don't go. Must be something going on down at the pond. We went down to the pond. Boy, we had a time at the pond. It only had, you know, eight, ten inches of water in it, but it was good and muddy. Boy, we had a big time. Came back to the house. They were inside playing rook. Walked into the house. Me and Quinn and Blake are muddy up to here. Man, we had it all over us. We were happy. Man, we'd been down the pond. We'd been playing. Nobody's hurt. Nothing's wrong. But he gave me that look. You remember when Jesus looked at Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord? I remembered the words of my daddy. On the way home that night, it's as vivid as it was last, as if it were last night. My sister spoke up and said, when I get home, I got to iron my dress for church tomorrow. My mother spoke up and said, well, when I get home, I got to wash some dishes left over from this afternoon. My daddy spoke up and said, when I get home, I got to whoop Michael. <laughs> I'll wash dishes. <laughs> and he did. Some of you are in the woodshed. Some of you are going to spend way too many years in the woodshed. You're neglecting your salvation. You're not walking with Him. He's not real to you. You've allowed some kind of sin. It's like we heard last night regarding the power of God. You can't know the power of God, and I believe as well you can't know His presence and peace as you should if you're allowing some kind of sin, immorality, any kind of action in your life that dishonors God, you can't know His power. You're neglecting salvation. You're not walking with God. 
The relevance is here. We are drifting. And the reason that he writes is evidently some of them had the idea we can escape what others have not escaped. Now this is my thinking. This is not about escaping hell. It's not about escaping the great white throne judgment. It's not about escaping the second death. It's about escaping the chastening of God. And oh, how we need it today. Oh, how we need to know the hand of God today. And oh, how we need to hear it from our pulpits. It's not just individuals that I believe that are living in the condition of the chastening hand of God, but churches as a whole. But there are risks involved. Which follows up the relevance and the reasoning behind his writing. And the risk involved is two words. And I'm reading from the New King James. It's just reward. When my dad whipped me that night after getting in the pond when he told me not to. It was just reward. He told me not to. I knew what I was doing. I knew what he said. I knew there would be a price to pay. But somehow I had the idea that I could come back from the pond with my buddies and we're happy and we're having a good time. Surely, surely he'll overlook this. What is a just reward? I was teaching this a couple of years ago in a Sunday morning Sunday school class at our home church. And I decided to ask the class, which was full of folks ranging anywhere from their 20s to their early 60s. It was just a conglomeration of ages and people who didn't go to another class but met in one location, mainly for those who dropped in late. And I'm teaching the class, and I ask, what is just reward? Because I admitted that I don't know for sure. I don't know exactly what it looks like. I don't know exactly what form it may take. I don't know exactly where it leads. I'm convinced that it's different for each of us, but the source is the same. One fellow in his early 20s, spoke up and said, sounds like karma. Well, that'd be great if we were Hindu. Now, I didn't bust him out that morning in front of the class because I, I think he meant well. In fact, I, I see that a lot on social media. And I see a lot of Christians using the word karma. Christians don't believe in karma. We don't. We don't believe your past actions determine your future fate. We do believe that you reap what you sow. Sometimes. You will reap what you sow unless God intervenes. We believe you're going to get what's coming to you. Sometimes. You're going to get what's coming to you unless God intervenes. We kind of believe what goes around comes around. Yes, sometimes. Unless God <clears throat> intervenes. And so we believe you reap what you sow, when you sow, where you sow, how you sow. That'll preach. We believe all of that unless God intervenes. And that's the idea in Hebrews 2. God has intervened. And you're neglecting what He's done. And if every transgression and disobedience in the past received a just reward, what makes you think you're going to escape the chastening and the punishing and the disciplining hand of God? Now while I don't know what this looks like, and while I can't describe it in detail, I think there are three possibilities and I'm not going to preach these. I just want to throw them out. I think Moses missing the promised land is a picture of just reward. He got a glimpse of it. 
He knew what he was missing. He knew the commandment of God. And he rebelled against God. And he missed the promised land. I'm not talking about he missed heaven. This is not about hell and the great white throne, all those things. He didn't miss heaven, so to speak. But he did miss blessings and favor and joy and all that God had for him in the promised land. I wonder how many of us are missing all that because of neglect. I think another illustration from the Scriptures is Israel wandering 40 years in the wilderness. How many of us are saved? But we spend our entire Christian journey never knowing the favor of God, never growing in the things of God. I wonder, I wonder, are you growing? You've been saved 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Are you growing? Do you know Him better than you did? And then the third illustration from Scriptures, I'm not sure that this is just reward. I'm just suggesting that it is God's people exiled for 70 years in Babylon. Jeremiah said, hey, you're going to be there a while. Build houses and plant gardens. This is not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. A 70-year Babylonian exile. You're going to be there a while? 70 years. I wonder how many of us, because if I'm neglecting my salvation, if I'm neglecting my walk with God, if I'm neglecting Jesus in my life, I wonder how many of us like Moses are going to miss the promised land in this life. I wonder how many of us like Israel, we're going to wander aimlessly and never really grow in knowing Him. And I wonder how many of us are going to spend our entire Christian journey exiled from where we need to be. I like the preacher Alistair Begg. You ever listen to Alistair Begg? And he tells the story of the grateful dog. He says he was in a particular area where he was going to preach a meeting and he and his wife were there and they decided in the cool of the afternoon before the meeting to go for a walk in the community instead as they were out walking around enjoying the day preparing their hearts and minds for the service that evening said as they were walking down the street a fella passed them on a bicycle he's pedaling he's a fine fella riding his bike in the cool of the day just as they are But the interesting thing about this fellow on the bike, right behind him on the seat was perched a fairly large dog. And the dog had his paws over the man's shoulders and was resting his head on his back. Do you see that? Imagine that. I want you to see it. Pretty good sized dog. Perched on a bicycle seat. Paws on his shoulders. Head on his back. They thought, wow, that's, that's odd. And so they kept walking, and phew, there he went by them again. They just thought, that's the most unusual thing we've ever seen. man riding the back, look at that dog hanging on. Hadn't moved a muscle, hadn't flinched. They rounded the corner, and the man on the bike with the dog behind him had stopped, and they were talking to another gentleman. And so Alistair Begg and his wife walked up, and his wife said to the gentleman on the bike, she said, wow, that's a pretty amazing dog you got there. She said, I bet you've had him since he was a puppy. And the man on the bike said, no, to tell you the truth, I've I've only had him a few weeks. Said, I was down at the dog pound the other day, and and he was on death row. He was going to die the next day, they told me. While he was not exactly what I was looking for, I decided to take him home. said, he's been with me ever since. Wow. I like dogs. I like that story and the picture that it paints. But I like even more the point that it makes. Charles Stanley says, whatever drives me to God is good. The best thing that ever happened to that old dog was death row. He would, have never, he would have never found a seat on a bicycle with a man that loved him. Some of us need some dog sense. 
I've been saved out of captivity. He saved me. Man, there's blessings and promises and favor in store. Man, there's joy like I'll never know, I'll never experience unless I keep walking with him. God help me not to get muddied down in neglect. Here's what that dog knew perched on that bicycle seat. He knew who found him. He knew who loved him. And he knew who saved him. And he was perfectly content to just ride around with the man who found him and loved him and saved him. Am I content with the one who found me and loved me and saved me? Well, Alistair Begg gave a little footnote to that story. The dog on the back of the bike was a pit bull. We've got the idea that when God saves pit bulls, He turns them into basset hounds. <laughs> you lose your snap. No! God can use a pit bull for His glory. God can use your tenacity. Amen? God's not necessarily going to make a, a, a basset hound out of you, but Brother Melvin, He might make a Jack Russell. God can use your personality. God can use your temperament. God needs you like you are. God can save you and use you for His glory. But if you're not careful, you'll spend your entire Christian journey just wandering with no hope, no direction, no joy, no peace. I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. But there's more to being saved than just going to heaven. There's more to being saved than missing hell. There is so great a salvation. If I don't think my sin was that big of a deal, I won't consider my salvation that big of a deal. It won't be so great a salvation. But my sin was a big deal. And I was so lost, I could have never saved myself. Hebrews tells us about so great a salvation. Hebrews tells us about such a high priest. He not only takes my sin away, he covers it and forgets it. Hebrews tells us about a sure and steadfast hope. Our hope is not in government. Our hope is not in Donald Trump. Our hope is not in the Republican or the Democratic Party. Our hope is not in being a Baptist. Our hope is not in cannons and guns and warfare. Our hope is in the Lord. Amen. And Hebrews tells us about a soon coming King. He's coming soon. After a little while He will come and He will not tarry. And thank God when this life is over, our life with Him begins. My plea to you this morning, don't neglect your salvation. I follow up with what Brother Melvin said. Don't get caught up wondering in bitterness. That's the word he chose earlier. There's a number of other words there. Don't get caught up wondering and meandering in bitterness and jealousy and envy and complacency and anger. Pursue the promised land. Would you pray with me?